For quite some time in my group, we've been working on methods to evaluate loop mimics for interfaces of protein-protein interactions. The objective is, if there's a hot loop, a loop containing hot spot at the protein-protein interface, we would like to be able to evaluate various designs very quickly. Our method is called BM, backbone matching. And sometimes we refer to it as IBM, interface backbone matching. The first publication on this appeared recently in Angovada Chemie. In the first video in this series, I've described how IBM works. In the final video in this series, I will describe how to use IBM, having downloaded it from GitHub via our website. In this video, I'd like to describe how we validated IBM for the protein-protein interaction, which is UPA with its receptor, UPAR. This is UPA binding UPAR. Biologically, it's quite an interesting protein-protein interaction, but for us, it's an excellent model because the interface is almost solely that loop shown in the pink box. It's essential to be aware of what the hotspots are in that loop. These are the residues we really want to include in any cyclo-organopeptide that we find. We need something to compare with. We need positive controls. We can compare with the linear peptide corresponding to that loop. Usually that doesn't get us anywhere because they don't bind very well at all. But in this particular case, we can compare with compounds like AE105 and AE147, which we can also fit the label to make fluorescence polarization, FP, assays easier. And it turns out that AE105 is one of the best ligands for UPAR. We went through the IBM process. We found three hits. They are different ring sizes and they overlay with the RMSD shown, which is excellent because we're overlaying every atom in the core confirmation. So we go about testing these. And the first thing we might do is take the backbone confirmation and attempt to dock it with the receptor, in this case, UPAR. Now remember, the backbone confirmation has all methyl side chains. We call it an all ala peptide. And when we try to dock it with UPAR, it finds a home on the protein surface, but it's not quite like that of the native protein ligand loop. We expect this because that backbone confirmation isn't displaying the side chain. And in our view, the receptor looks at those side chains like a glove looking for the right hand to fit in to this glove. It needs those side chains to form the correct interactions at a protein-protein interface, in fact. So then what do we do? We adjust the molecule. We put in the native side chains corresponding to where our analog overlaid. And then we repeat the docking procedure and ta-da, the molecule moves. It moves into a binding pose, which is similar to that seen in the protein-protein interaction. We get a better docking saw, indicative of a higher affinity for UPAR. So that validates virtually. And now at last, it's necessary to get into the lab and make these things. So we made one, two, and three, and we began to test them. First of all, in fluorescence polarization assay. In green here, we showed the binding for our control, A105, as a Ki relative to the other control, FITC labeled. And then we show the binding as Ki's in micromolar for compounds one, two, and three. One and two were better than three, that's in fluorescence polarization, but you can see that the lowest in the series is AE105, the best ligand I know. That beat our three. But then we did an ELISA-based assay. We looked at the three analogs and we got these data. And in the ELISA screen, HIT1 binds marginally tighter than AE105, and both of those were better than two and three. So on the basis of this, we argue that HIT1 is probably comparable binding to AE105. Let's look a bit closer at AE105. It's the best binding control that I know of. 
It contains a non-canonical amino acid. It contains two D amino acids. What's the origin of AE105? Well, AE105 was discovered in a split synthesis screening 3 million compounds containing D and non-canonical amino acids. It binds UPAR with a similar affinity to the native ligand UPA, and that is 0.04 nanomole. The experiment with IBM was made making, I think, only five analogs. And we didn't consider D or non-canonical amino acids, and we easily could. And we found one had slightly inferior binding in the FP assay, but a very marginally superior binding in the ELISA assay. We think one and AE105 are comparable, but we put very much less work in the lab to discover our lead. And that's the purpose, to take us to candidates as quickly as we possibly can with not a scrap of lab work, avoiding experimentation altogether. But we would like to have a negative control and the negative control is a bit psychological here. We asked ourselves, well, if a medicinal chemist was designing a cycloorganopeptide, what might they come up with? And we'll give the medicinal chemist a hand We'll say, okay, we'll tell you what the ring size is and where it overlays. That's a big advantage. We considered ourselves as coming at this project from blind, and we thought of a couple of organic fragments like those in cyclooganopeptides one and two. In other words, our best binding IBM hits. And what we came up with is one prime, one double prime, and one triple prime containing three organic groups that I honestly couldn't predict would be better or worse binders in a cycloorganic peptide without making them and doing the experiment. But IBM predicts that compound one is going to be the best. And recall, compound one has a Ki of 2.6 micromolar. What about one prime, one double prime, and one triple prime? When we tried to overlay them, we got these RMSDs, all inferior to compound one, and we tested them after making them in the FP assay, and their binding was all inferior to compound one. These intuitive controls were worse than BM did for us. IBM simulates core conformations of cyclooganopeptides to find ones which populate those corresponding to interface loops. Because what we want to do is mimic or disrupt protein-protein interactions, or simply find a ligand that binds on the surface of a protein. It's based on a hypothesis, and the hypothesis is that the core conformations matching the interface loops can be simulated in solution using all allyl peptides. When we actually find one that overlays well, we make a similar cycloorganopeptide, except it contains the native side chains corresponding to those which bind the protein receptor at that loop region. This dramatically reduces the number of molecular simulations because each cycloorganic peptide made with only alanine represents, say, 18 amino acids at every different position. So there's a lot of combinations of those, which by a conventional docking technique will have to be tested. But we just do those cycloorganic peptides corresponding to the different ring sizes with the different organic fragments. And in our case, that was about 600. We simulate the core conformations of these virtual libraries once, and we can apply them to any PPI. Once we've done it, we're not using docking data on a particular protein receptor, we're just matching with the crystal structure coordinates to find the best overlay. Chen Xiong Mi wrote the computer scripts, did the molecular modeling, made the compounds, and performed the biophysical assays. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.